Right. Hi everyone, my name is Matthew Griffin. I am the CEO and founder of the 311 Institute, a global futures and deep futures think tank looking up to 50 years out. We span over 600 emerging technologies, hundreds of mega trends across every sector, every region, every line of business. And in this particular presentation, we're not going to be talking about the future of work per se. We're going to be talking about something much more nuanced. We're going to be talking about the future of jobs and specifically skills. Because even though these are actually a subset of the future of work, I find I that very few people actually really focus on how, what we are doing today to either automate or augment hard and soft skills. So, now if you're an organization that at the moment is actually having a look at the future of work and you are wondering basically what the future of skills look like in your organization, I'd actually encourage you to watch this. Now, this is my agenda. So we're going to be talking about foundations. This is kind of just a baselining of where we are today, basically with different things. Uh, we're going to be looking at the impact of automation. We're going to be looking at technology and auto augmentation. I will explain what that means basically as we go through. Then we're going to be having a look at timing and technology. So while we often think of artificial intelligence as being this single amorphous thing, it's actually lots of different things. There are lots of different kinds of artificial intelligences and they make a big difference on what we can automate and when. And I will show you that and I'll go into that in a lot more detail in that section. Then we're going to have a look at what you as organisations can actually do to prepare basically for a future that increasingly looks nothing like the past. Now consider this. And now this sounds like a rather silly question but what would your organization look like? What would the culture of your organization look like and feel like? And therefore, what would the results that your organization produces be if everybody, everybody within your organization had access to every conceivable skill, hard skill and soft skill, and all knowledge? Now, when we have a look at knowledge, basically we have knowledge that is outside of an organization and knowledge that is inside of an organization. And depending on your company's data governance and information policies, you have access to different sets. However, when we actually have a look at skills, I'm going to show you precisely what I mean by this. And it's surprising. It also shows you a fundamentally different future of the world of work. Now, when we have a look at the mega trends that we're actually seeing in more specifically the skills space, as I travel around the world, last year I was in 60 different countries, I find that leaders are often precluded to talk about how we automate different parts of our business rather than how do we augment the people within our business using whatever technology is on the truck. So, while every organization has an automation project in its ICT department, how many have an augmentation project? Typically it'll come under how do we improve employee productivity, that kind of thing. But when I talk about augmentation versus automation, we go much, much further than just productivity enhancements. Now, 55% of what happens to your organization actually happens from external trends and external factors. So things like climate change, geopolitics, supply chain snarl-ups, hyperinflation, and so on and so forth. So this actually affects what your organization looks like in the future. Consumer behaviors, regulations, they're all changing, as you know. Uh, when we have a look at the growing education gap, whether we have a look at secondary education, a little bit less so university education, increasingly everyone that I talk to around the world feels that there is a in gap between what the current educational system is delivering and doing versus what organisations need in terms of future skills and future ready people. Hiring priorities. So increasingly when we have a look at hiring priorities, People are now starting to focus a little bit more on hiring people with the right soft skills. And we'll show you why in a bit. Mental resilience. 65% of adults today are actually worried about the future. Now they're worried about the future because of a couple of things. Now firstly, it could be climate change. However, AI and the automation of jobs is actually driving a lot of worry around the world. 
So your company and its individuals need to be mentally resilient. You know, mental resilience is a skill, which is why I've put it in here. Uh, when we have a look at what private equity is doing with education, ironically, some of the world's largest educational groups, so these are primary and secondary education groups, as well as MOOCs, the massive online course organizations, basically like edX, for example, are being snapped up by private equity, which is a little bit odd, but generally private equity, when they come in, they buy a particular asset, they start packaging it up with new mergers and acquisitions, and in most cases, private equity triple the value of their assets before exiting. However, education has caught the eye of private equity because they feel that there is a lot of untapped value there. And they also feel that there are economies of scale. They also feel that it's increasingly important, basically, as we have a look at this rather fast and furious future that we're heading into. And then we have the speed of change. Now, I talk about the speed of change a lot. I've shown you many, many times how we can actually disrupt the global status quo in a day. I can have an idea this morning, and if I can execute properly, properly, et cetera, et cetera, I could have that idea, that product, that new service in front of people by the end of the day, and up to four and a half billion people could be using it. So when we talk about the speed of change, the speed of change is accelerating, and I still haven't met any business leader yet, despite the fact I've been talking about generative artificial intelligence for well over a decade, whose business strategy, vision, and plans managed to survive chat GPT. Yeah. So when we actually have a look at the speed of change, it shouldn't be lost on anyone that the world that we live in today is changing in all kinds of immeasurable ways much faster than it ever has in the past. Now, when we have a look at surveys basically from LinkedIn and Microsoft, allegedly 78% of companies are hiring for soft skills first, and these are predominantly communication skills and so on and so forth, ability to learn, etc because they can teach you the hard skills. And increasingly, a lot of different companies around the world have been creating their own nano degrees for the simple reason that they don't think the current educational system is teaching children the hard skills that they actually need to survive in the corporate world or even get into the corporate world. However, a little while ago, basically, I was in Athens and I met the European Managing Director basically, of Oracle and he actually corrected me. He said, Matthew, these are not soft skills. These are power skills. And I agree with him. Soft skills, communication, collaboration, tone, intonation, everything that you're kind of seeing here, it's a power skill in the future. Now, when we have a look at just automation for the sake of automation's sake, we have lots of different organizations saying that by 2030, we should be able to slash will be able to automate or partially automate up to 80% of jobs. Now, when you have a look at the different technologies that are coming through, whether it's artificial intelligence or general purpose robotics, so physical robots, this figure realistically is up to 100%. However, when we actually have a look at skills themselves, the fact of the matter is that the vast majority of skills now seem to have a half-life of between two and five years. So what we mean by that is if you actually left university and you started work at a particular company and you were the world's best programmer, then when you begin that job, that particular skill has a very, very high value to the company that's employed you. Five years later or less, it has half the amount of value to that company, and then it halves and halves again. Which really means that by the time you're actually in your 40s, if you're a university leaver, the skills that you actually did inherit and learn at university or wherever you actually went to school are almost valueless. Yeah, nothing is ever truly valueless, but this is enough to change basically how we think about learning and development in the future. Now, another statistic, as I start digging in, so I've been writing a new book, basically, on the future of education, training, skills, jobs, and automation. That's a mouthful. And you can download it from the QR code over there. Um, it's called The Future of Education and Training, by the way. One thing I've actually been noticing as I dig into all of the different data sets is that compared to five years ago, 
we are automating skills 40 to 55% faster using artificial intelligence than ever before. And as we head into the next five or 10 years, this number increases again. So just consider that. The half-life of skills basically is shorter than it's ever been and we are automating skills, different skills, at different speeds, faster than ever before. Everything is accelerating. Now, while we often think about skills in really t from two perspectives, hard skills versus soft skills, when we think about augmenting skills and or automating skills, I encourage you to actually think about the future of skills with these two lenses. So the first lens is behind the screen. So skills that are behind the screen. Now the reason for that is when you're actually watching this particular video, I could be a digital human. I could be using an artificial voice synthesizer and all that kinds of different things. However, if I was in person, you would know that I haven't been automated. So increasingly, organizations are trying to automate what happens, so the activities that happen behind a screen. So think about that for a moment. If someone is presenting you with an Excel spreadsheet, then behind the screen on their computer system, they have done something. That's prime for automation. Customer service behind the screen, content and marketing behind the screen, etc., etc. So this is really where we look at artificial intelligence and we look at robotic process automation. But the world of AI is changing and RPA is done. Now, skills that are behind a screen are much faster to automate than skills that we use in the real world. So think electricians, plumbers, gardeners, all that kind of stuff. And in this particular world, these physical skills, well, we start automating them with general purpose robots. And that takes a much, much greater amount of time to automate simply because it's easier to automate things digitally than it is to automate things physically. Now, as we start having a look at the impact of automation, consider this. Your organization's cost of accessing knowledge and skills is dropping through the floor. And again, I'm going to show you exactly why this is. This is partly down to artificial intelligence. But when we actually have a look at skills, as artificial intelligence automates different skills, so for example, this is a competency matrix for a data scientist. Now in the United States, a typical data scientist, a good data scientist, can expect to earn around $100,000. But when we actually have a look at the future of jobs and work and skills and everything else, a couple of things we care about. So we care about, for example, what skills and what jobs can be automated. But when we look at the future, what we also care about is what jobs can humans do in the future and where are the good pay or where, hmm, where are the well paid jobs? Now, the amount of compensation that we actually give to a job actually relies on 18 market factors. Only 28% of the remuneration for a particular job has anything to do with hard or soft skills. So let me give you an example. So in this example, we have the competency matrix in blue for a software developer, um, and they're earning about $100,000. Now, the reason they're earning $100,000 is it's a relatively high-skilled job. However, software developers are high in demand and are relatively scarce compared to that demand. Now, if we use artificial intelligence to start automating software development, all of a sudden that skill becomes abundant. And as that skill becomes abundant, suddenly supply and demand catch up. So when we actually have a look at this, if I can get it, there we go, this. Now, when you have a look at talent scarcity, when talent scarcity is high, that job is paid about $100,000. When it is low, in other words, that particular skill is ubiquitous, that, from a remuneration policy, 
means that we hardly pay you at all. So there are lots and lots of different factors that go into whether or not a job is highly paid or low paid. Skills are just one of the factors. But the point of that is this. As different skills become more abundant in the marketplace, wages get depressed. Because your ability as a software de developer to command a $100,000 salary in a market that is fooled with people, filled with people who can do software development, and I'll show you how in a bit, all of a sudden, you aren't being paid $100,000, you're being paid $75,000 or $50,000 or $35,000 or whatever it happens to be. So AI and different technologies are already depressing wages. And it will only go down from there. And a lot of this money will be sucked up by the, giant, by the tech giants, who simply then offer you software developer as a service via the Microsoft Azure cloud. Now, we're also seeing the end of T-shaped individuals. We all went to school, we all came out of school, got a job, and we became an expert in really one job accountancy, finance, corporate risk, auditing, sales, whatever it happens to be. And we start that job in a junior position and we end our career in that job in a senior position, hopefully. But we are seeing the end of T-shaped individuals because technology is letting us all increasingly get access to every and any skill. We're also seeing the end of skill silos. Now this is important because when you have a look at your own organization, you will have line of, lines of business that are really orientated around skill silos. You will have people in the sales team who have sales and negotiation skills, people in the finance team who have a variety of other skills. You will have people basically in the leadership team who have a variety of other skills, leadership skills, you know, et cetera, et cetera. People in the marketing department who will have marketing and communication and or design skills. So for example, a salesperson does not necessarily and is not expected to have design skills because they don't produce marketing content. However, as artificial intelligence basically gives us all access to all skills, the people in sales, on the one hand, can sell. But if they want to create some marketing content, they just use an artificial intelligence if the company lets them, and they can use an AI to create a new marketing flyer, a new synthetic content video, or whatever it happens to be. So we're seeing the end emerging. This is an early stage trend that we're seeing at the moment. We're seeing the end of skill silos. So these two slides fundamentally change how we think about an organization in terms of hierarchies, lines of business, you know, the, the division of labor and tasks. Hence my first, one of my first slides anyway, what happens when everyone in your organization has access to all skills? Now, from a tech and auto augmentation, which is a play on words because it's automation with augmentation, that's quite different as well to what it used to be. ChatGPT today has a verbal IQ of 155, which puts it on a level with Elon Musk and Albert Einstein. It has a thousand times more general knowledge, general knowledge, not specialist knowledge, than any human on Earth. And that was in 2023. And it's still getting better and better. And it learns 300 million times faster than any human, which in the words of Jeffrey Hinton means that it is a superior learning algorithm to the human brain. So just think of that when we think about the context as that relates to skills. Now, as I said, there are different kinds of artificial intelligence and you really have to pay attention to the different types of AI because they are good at different things and they have different capabilities. This is incredibly impactful and I will show you why later from a timing perspective. But increasingly we're moving from interacting from, with a single AI that kind of checks its brain and then gets back to us to AIs basically that you talk to that then talk to other AIs, so these are AI agents, and that 
AI that you talk to talks to other AIs to accomplish whatever you asked that original AI to do. So it's a little bit like if your AI had access to the gig economy, where the gig economy isn't millions of human workers with different attributes, capabilities, and skills. They're AI agents. Now, as we have a look at 2028, which it's worth to note, basically is four years away now, we estimate that artificial general intelligence, which the definition of which basically is still up for a lot of debate, will have a verbal IQ of 1600 and a billion times more general knowledge than any human. And when we talk about AGI definitions, it's believed that Sam Altman uh, says, AGI is the point in time where artificial intelligence is capable of outperforming all humans at all economically valuable work. Now let that sink in for a moment and think about the impact that that has on the global services industry, the automation of labor, but also the automation of skills. It is significant. However, while in 2028, we will undoubtedly, undoubtedly have increasingly powerful AIs because companies like Microsoft are investing $100 billion in building just one giant AI data center, let alone the other sort of 300 AI data centers that we're seeing deployed around the world at the moment, these AIs will be incredibly game-changing. And there's also another technology. When we talk about, for example, the automation of soft skills especially, we need to think about rendering technologies. And this is why I said, Think of skills behind the screen. So this is Digital Doug. Now, Digital Doug is a high resolution digital human avatar. And if he was here instead of me, would you really know the difference? And when we have a look at digital humans, we are embedding them with neural network brains. We are embedding them with emotions. They are increasingly able to mimic human facial patterns and movements and everything else. And in fact, they increasingly look authentically like real humans. In fact, at the moment, even just with the latest state of the art technologies, about 80% of people can't tell a digital human, a good digital human, from an actual human. In fact, they think the actual humans are actually the fakes. There we go. Now, as part of my work to investigate the future of skills, I had to really, really dig into skills. Now, I spent about a month, believe it or not, trying to ensure that I had categorized every single conceivable kind of hard skill on the planet into 18 umbrella categories. Now, we know that there are hundreds of thousands of hard skills, but they all fit very neatly into these 18 hard skills categories. Now, what we have here is on the left-hand side, basically we've got the level of automation, zero to 100%, and then the timeline. So the timeline goes from today to about 2035. And what you'll notice is all of the hard skills are generally clustered. So we think at the moment, basically we will be able to automate around 50% of the hard skills within a particular category at a minimum. So if we have a look, for example, down here at number five, that's the lowest one. Now, number five is corporate responsibility skills. So I'll explain a little bit more about this in a moment. And up here, we've got number 11 and number 14, uh, which are roughly sort of 90, 90 to 95% automated by 2035. So number 11 is information technology skills and number 14 is manufacturing and production skills. Now, ironically, the reason why we see such a clustering of hard skills like this, and I'll show you the soft skills cluster in a moment, is simply because think about the companies that are actually developing these AIs. They are technology companies. 
generally. And technology companies about 10 years ago started to realize that they couldn't hire enough software developers or people with technical skills. And even if they could hire those people, the wages were very, very high. So remember that first diagram I showed you. So what did they do? The answer to their problems was automate those skills. So for the past 10 years, companies like Google and Microsoft have actually been working very, very hard behind the scenes to automate as much of that technology skill stack as they can. But also they want to increasingly automate all these other things as well. So when we have a look at the actual umbrella skills, we've got analytical skills, business management, business operations, clinical and medical skills, corporate responsibility, creative and design skills, which are different to human soft skill, uh, sort of creativity, I'll explain that in a bit, uh, economic skills, engineering skills, and finance skills. Now, finance skills are different to economic skills because when we talk about finance skills, we're talking really in terms of corporate finance, whereas economic skills is very much more about global economics, market economics, and everything else. Green skills, information technology skills, learning and development skills. So this is our ability to learn, for example. Um, so legal skills, manufacturing and production, physical skills, research and development, sales skills, and specialist trade skills. So those are the 18 hard skill umbrella categories that I've been investigating, and we kind of come up with this spread. Now, when we actually have a look at our ability to use artificial intelligence basically to automate different hard skills, what I did here is I used ChatGPT. There are other AIs available like Anthropic, uh, Anthropic's Claude 3 model. Uh, obviously, we have Google Gemini, but there's a lot more. We've got Mistral as well. We've also got Ernie from uh, Baidu and Alibaba over in uh, China. But what I wanted to do here is use an artificial intelligence to automate market research. Then we get an artificial intelligence basically to start demonstrating its automative automation skills prowess. So we get it to do sentiment analysis, a AWS Terraform deployment, and we also get it to do some threat, cyber threat detection. So what I did is, and again, you know, this is when I say we have increasingly easy access to skills, but also knowledge, this is what I mean. So what we have here is up the top, you can see, give me a list of the top three in demand hard skill domains in the US today, okay? And the AI goes through it and here it is, AI and machine learning, no surprise there, cloud computing, and then cybersecurity, okay? Now, what we then do, or what I then did, is I said acting as an expert because how you talk to these artificial intelligences is important. Really, you should try to talk to them as you would talk to a human, uh, which is rather ironic, but they are trained on human language and they have a verbal IQ of 155. Uh, what we then do basically is simply say, acting as an expert, show me a demonstration of your ability to automate something or other of, this, of these particular hard skills. Now, what you'll see here is, this is using Python at the moment, um, but what we have here is we have an artificial intelligence basically that is actually just written a uh, sentiment analysis script in Python. Now imagine you're a sales guy and you actually want to analyze market sentiment, but you don't want to have to go and phone up the IT team. You can create your own Python scripts and you can maybe run those in a Salesforce environment or a Microsoft environment to do some basic sentiment analysis. There you go. Um, however, what we also have that's just gone off the uh, top there is we also have the artificial intelligence writing a Terraform AWS deployment script. And now it's writing a cybersecurity threat detection script. So I do a lot of work in the national security space and we talk about we talk about criminals ability to use these kinds of artificial intelligences to write malware and ransomware much faster than ever before with relatively little to no skill. So now imagine this from a cybersecurity perspective, we flip that script to the defenders 
And we now say, as defenders, write a new malware identification program that will help me identify, for example, polymorphic malware coming from Russia or whatever it happens to be. When I say that these tools are democratizing access to skills, I mean it. But in addition to that, as an individual or as an organization, you really have to consider what happens when you all have access to almost any skill that originally would have been in those silos, those line of business silos. It really does fundamentally change the makeup of an entire organization and how we actually think about lines of business, hierarchies, matrix organizations, and so on and so forth. Now, when we have a look at soft skills, there are about 240 soft skills, and I managed to put these into 15 umbrella categories. Again, it took me about a month. Now, when we actually have a look at automating humans, you know, a lot of people say, ah, oh, you know, we're automating humans. What we're doing is we're automating hard skills first because hard skills are process driven. If you understand the process, you can generally automate a hard skill. It's much, much more difficult to automate a soft skill because soft skills like decision making, communication, collaboration, you know, all the empathy, they're very hard to actually codify. Now, when we actually have a look at all the different things that make us human, you know, we have empathy, empowerment, enthusiasm, envy, we've got uh, opportunity recognition, optimism, we've got self-confidence, you know, over here, we've got presentation skills and pride, you know, hopefully my presentation skills are okay. Uh, we've got excitement, you know, we've got experimentation. So this is you as a human. Now, when we actually have a look at our ability to automate soft skills, notice this spread compared with the hard skills spread. Um, it's much, much more dispersed uh, and less clustered. Now, at the bottom, so I'll go through these. These are the soft skills. These are the umbrella categories for the soft skills. We've got adaptability and resilience, collaboration, communication, learning, aptitude and mindset, creative and innovative thinking. So this is where, from a human perspective, this kind of creativity doesn't require a certi certificate or training. This is where we are innately creative, a little bit messy, you know, in intuitively innovative, etc. So. Uh, we've got critical thinking and problem solving, cultural competence, we've got emotional intelligence, entrepreneurial mindset, we have interdisciplinary thinking and interpersonal skills, leadership skills, moral intelligence and integrity, professionalism and work ethic and self-management. So as you can see, there are 15 umbrella categories. And when I'm trying to ascertain basically which categories are more likely to be automated than others, and then which individual soft skills within those categories can be automated. It's a huge piece of work. Um, however, when we have a look at this, you know, we see that number three will be the most automated, communication skills. And we're already seeing that. So increasingly, artificial intelligence is better at communicating than many people. I don't know if it says that's that much about people, frankly, uh, or our education system. But you know, when you have a look at this spread, sort of in the next 10 years, and you combine the soft skills automation with the hard skills automation charts, we start getting a better picture of which hard skills and which soft skills are more likely to be automated first, and which ones are going to be left for us humans to do. So like on the last one, basically we saw corporate responsibility as being one of the hardest things to automate. And part of the reason for that is because as CSR, we're dealing with regulations, we're dealing with governance, we're dealing with lots of different entities and bodies in different jurisdictions and regions around the world. It requires you to be able to spin a lot of plates and pull a lot of strings. As it were, software development, there's obviously an imperative by the tech giants to automate that as quickly as possible for their own shareholder benefit. Now, when we have a look at automating soft skills, increasingly, these different technologies are getting very, very good at mimicking human soft skills, mimicking human emotions. 
So here's an example of that. You might have seen this, it's the ChatGPT 4.0 launch, but just think about the number of soft skills that are actually involved basically in this particular demonstration. And then think about how they've actually been automated, essentially, within an artificial intelligence. Big round of applause, big round of applause. So just think about the number of soft skills that were automated in that demo, and then think about some of the hard skills as well. Now, this is actually being used in telepsychiatry at the moment because we don't have enough psychiatrists or counselors around the world. So increasingly artificial intelligence is stepping in really in the form of bots to help people reduce anxiety, depression, and all these different sort of things. So when we have a look at just that simple demo, it's phenomenal. And what's even more phenomenal, as well as slightly odd, if we're uh, being honest, is a little while ago, MetLife, which is an insurance organization in America, started using artificial intelligence to help teach its customer services clerks empathy of all things. So we actually, ironically, I know basically for those of you that have actually used customer service agents, myself included, you think they could probably do with a dose of empathy. It's actually rather ironic that humans are being taught empathy by AI. That's just crazy. But in all seriousness, this brings us to the usefulness of technology to augment humans and coach humans. We're seeing AIs increasingly coach educate and train people in different things, including game strategy. So artificial intelligence basically is this rather complex beast see, that we love to hate and that confuses the shit out of us. Now, you know earlier basically I said that technology matters, especially when it comes to the timing of when we can automate different hard and soft skills in this particular case. Now, when we have a look at the skills that we could automate, we can automate all of them, provided we can understand the process. If we understand the inputs and the outputs of that skill, 
and the process, the workflow that goes on in the middle, we can turn that into an artificial intelligence model and therefore we can automate it. And then we start sticking those skills together to kind of create, for example, a functional neural network enabled digital human. And all of a sudden we go from automating one skill to two skills and the, the benefit of that to organizations and to us at large increases many fold. So should we say the utility of that and its usefulness and its value increases a lot. However, when we actually have a look at what we can't automate throughout the research that I've been doing, while we can automate pretty much every job and every skill, the candidates that aren't ripe for automation are any jobs or any skills that require a personal human touch. And I'm being very deliberate with this wording here. So again, remember at the start, Bessie, I said, skills behind the screen and then skills in the real world. Now, for example, if you take an elderly, care, an elderly person in a care home, you could actually have a robot looking after them. We see that in Japan at the moment, and that's a trend that's on the rise. However, if you need a personal human touch, it doesn't matter how automatable by see that particular skill or job is, it shouldn't be automated. Dare we say, can't be automated. So that's the rough split on what we can automate and what we can't automate. And then of course, when we have a look at automation or augmentation using technology, the big question is, but when will we be able to do that? And it depends on the tech. So let's have a look at software development. Now, if you move back five years ago and you're having conversations with software developers as I was, as lots of people, for example, on LinkedIn were, but see software developers, as well as lots of futurists were saying, we will never ever be able to automate software development. Now I've been talking about software development automation for at least 10 years. And the fact of the matter is, if you actually look at software development automation through the lens of traditional machine learning based artificial intelligences, in order to create a program with tens of thousands of lines of code, which is really what we sort of term more, a more advanced program, we estimate it'll take six years. You know, we see programs with the US military that are trying to do this, et cetera, et cetera, but realistically, it's six years off. However, when we use artificial intelligence agents, and the first ones that we saw were AutoGPT, you can look that one up on Google, the latest one is Devin. So Devin is an artificial intelligence agent based autonomous software developer platform where you simply say, create this kind of software and Devin uh, will go off. It will understand what you mean, what you want, and it will then go off, identify all the different miniature artificial intelligence agents that can help it fulfill its task its goal, and then it will manage them all, and then it will come back and say, here you go, I built your software for you. Um, interestingly enough, at Harvard, we actually used artificial intelligence agents to build 70 companies. So one was a enterprise CRM software company, and it built it in seven minutes for a dollar. Agents magnify the power and the capability of artificial intelligence by millions of fold. This is the equivalent of you being an individual and me asking you to do something versus you being an, in, in, being an individual and having access to the entire global human gig economy to help you fulfill my request. It is significant, but also comes with absolutely titanic cyber security and risk issues. Now, when we have a look at B2B, B2C, and those kinds of relationships, provided it's behind the screen, we increasingly have artificial intelligences that are able to automate kind of any format. So face-to-face, -face, I'll show you that in a moment, text and voice. So for example, think of you talking to a customer service bot, 
sounds authentically human. Uh, think about an artificial intelligence that is generating your report for you, or whatever it happens to be. You know, or an AI that is saying, your delivery is lost, uh, sorry about that, bog off. Um, so our ability to use technology to automate B2B and B2C relationships, like procurement, for example, you know, automated procurement processes, all that kind of stuff, um, is quite significant already. However, when we actually have a look at the combination of effective computing and digital humans, where effective computing is essentially a kind of computing that is able to understand human emotions. So if I shout at the computer, it says, hey, calm down, you know, have a coffee, take a chill. Um, effective AI and effective computing are, when dealing with us messy humans, is very important. Now, when you have a look at the next video that I've prepared for you, Again, think of it as behind the screen, but also think how many hard and soft, soft skills have been automated by this. Welcome to Phishing 101 and how to avoid digital traps. In this video, we'll explore the essentials of identifying and preventing phishing attacks through three key concepts. One, recognize phishing by noting odd emails, urgent tones, typos, strong passwords, two-factor authentication, data encryption, and avoid dubious links or email. Three, if you suspect phishing, don't click links, report it to your IT, and watch accounts. Remember, staying informed is your best defense. Thank you for watching, and stay safe. Now that's Anna. She's a digital human. She's actually pre-programmed some of them have their own neural network brains, but it's a way you can talk to them and interact in a relatively human, authentic, authentic human manner. But she was pre-programmed. But if you didn't know that she was a digital human, would you have known? Or well, if you didn't know that she was a digital human, would you have suspected that she wasn't? So this is an example of automation in action again, because we didn't need a human actress, we didn't need a film crew, we didn't even need a location, or facilities staff, or health and safety staff, or we didn't need legal to sign off, basically, on the, on the space. Uh, we didn't need someone to organize the event space, or whatever it happens to be. So there's a lot of automation that's gone on there, but there's also a lot of human kind of value that has actually been sucked out. And in this case, organizations are able to use these kinds of technologies to reduce their cost of internal communication by up to like 95 to 98%. So that's the economic dividend that organizations are looking at. But from an individual's perspective, would I actually like to be automated by that? No. Um, so we do have to carefully balance automation within a business with the use of technology to improve people's potential productivity and livelihoods. And then from an organization perspective, this is how we prepare. So there's two things basically that we actually look at. Now, as leaders, basically we should actually look at what parts of the organization just make sense to automate. And then what parts of the organization make sense to augment. But when we talk about augmenting people within our organization, we're not just talking about using tech to improve their productivity. We're talking about using tech to improve their skills, their knowledge, basically, of something, whatever it happens to be. There are lots of different things that we can actually use technology to augment, basically, within this construct. And then, from an organizational perspective, organizations, at a really fundamental level, are actually really selfish. Everything is about the company itself. Now, this is where we have a look at something called scalable efficiency. Every single organization on the planet really wants to try and sell as many products and services as it can, as efficiently and as cost effectively as possible. 
In which case, automation makes a huge amount of sense because we've seen the development of fully autonomous organizations already. They can operate very lean for literally cents on the dollar. Um, however, when we actually have a look at this, you know, an organization also needs to grow. It needs to create value. And that's what humans are really good at doing. So now imagine an organization where everybody within the organization is empowered with technology. Everyone in the organization is creative. Everyone in the organization could create new products at will, on demand. What a difference there is between automating an entire company and intelligently augmenting everyone within the company using technology. If I said to you, what, or which organization do you think is ultimately going to have more revenues? An organization that is fully autonomous or an organization that has lots and lots of people where everybody is empowered within that organization to help the organization find new markets and new ways to grow and create value. While it's very much a discussion point, you could kind of go either way. From what I see traveling around the world, I actually think that a company that is full of empowered humans will beat a fully autonomous company in terms of share price, share value, EBITDA, et cetera, et cetera. But it wouldn't be easy, I'll grant you that. And then when we actually have a look at the kind of organization that you're trying to create in the future, you also need to ask the question, what do customers need? And ultimately, customers want to be able to engage with your company as seamlessly and as frictionlessly as possible and to transact efficiently with you. In other words, we want to work with your organization in a way that doesn't stress us out. We want to do whatever it is that we do, buy whatever it is that we want to buy, and we want to get that product. So these two slides really sort of hit to the heart of really what matters when it comes to the future of companies and organizations and the skills and the people that you actually have. And then, of course, if you aren't really sure what your company will be in the future or will need in the future, then we can use reverse brainstorming and we can look at what won't the organization be. So, for example, the organization in the future won't be harder to deal with. So by definition, we flip it, it'll be easier to deal with. Okay, well, how will the organization be easier to deal with in the future? And then we kind of go through all the different job roles and the different ways that customers can interact and engage basically with said organization. Not necessarily just with people, but actually with the technology that that organization has as well. And then when we actually have a look at the next five years, the general assessment is that these jobs and these skills in green will grow and these ones in red will diminish. So analytics, change management. So as the world around us changes faster than ever before, organizations are going to need to change almost everything that they do and they're going to have to change faster on kind of the hamster wheel of corporate life. Uh, GRC, uh, regulations, basically there are hundreds of European regulations coming through that's a growth area. Green, so green industry, so this is ESG ostensibly. Uh, when we have a look at legal affairs, as we see more regulations and compliance requirements, whether that's around new products, whether it's around technology, whether it's around green and ESG, we of course need more lawyers. And of course, lawyers can be automated, but the amount of legislation coming through is staggering. Um, security and risk, now these are split into two because on the one hand, as you become a digital organization that has intelligence fused within it, where AI is your increasingly intelligence transformation, there are going to be new cybersecurity risks. That's it. And then in addition to that, when we have a look at risk itself, we have more risks in the form of environment, politics, economy, et cetera, et cetera. And then strategy. As the world around us changes faster, you are going to have to keep adapting your strategy in order to keep up. Yeah, the vast majority of business strategies did not actually fare well when ChatGPT came out and actually quite a number of companies, especially in the edtech space, went bust within the space of like three days. So 
When we have a look at accounting, increasingly organizations are trying to automate accounting, admin and clerical activities, legacy ICT and legacy manufacturing are also increasingly at risk of, should we say, either being automated or being pushed out of the business. And then Marcom, so increasingly, a lot of my clients include companies like WPP and Dentsu. And increasingly, I can show you how we automate the entire Marcom life cycle. So that's everything from understanding the client brief all the way through to production and ultimate publication. Uh, and then sales. Now sales, I actually found sort of quite an odd one when I was doing my research as a, shall we say, job or skill that's increasingly being diminished. But in some cases it makes sense. So we see the rise of e-commerce naturally. We see the rise of e-commerce based bots and so on and so forth. So that behind the glass uh, screen, again, that behind the glass sort of trend again. However, we also have digital humans. So Mercedes is now starting to sell cars using digital humans. So if the vast majority of your sales or sales processes take place behind a screen, i.e. not in person, we are automating sales. Now, Tiffany Bova, who was uh, the head of sales at Salesforce a little while ago, but since she was sort of ex-Gartner, I remember her about 10 years ago saying, you know, we will never ever be able to automate sales categorically. You know, you could probably search it up. And I remember it was on LinkedIn basically at the time, I think I basically commented saying, you know, inevitably we will because sales is a process. You know, if you're an in, inside salesperson, you know, the, you know the score. You sit down at your desk, you open your prospect list, uh, you understand the products that you're actually selling, you understand where you are against target, uh, you then start putting together a variety of different communications to try to hook in prospective clients and buyers and so on and so forth. And then you negotiate something if you get a hook and then you close the deal. Increasingly, AI is actually capable of doing that. And we've actually seen a number of fully autonomous sales AIs emerging, albeit very few. But sales? Yeah, we can increasingly automate that as well. So. As I say, I was a little bit surprised by that, but also not. Now, when we have a look at skills specifically, as we move further into the future, whether it's as an individual or as an organization, we need switchable hard skills. So you are going to need to switch in and switch out your hard skills faster than ever before, because different hard skills are being automated at different rates then it just depends what is the hard skill that you are a specialist in. And then you need solid soft skills. These generally don't change, but obviously adaptability, collaboration, uh, confidence, creativity, the things that actually make us human. So on that chart where we had 240 different kinds of soft skills, you need to be all of that and you need to be as good at it as you can be, except for the anger piece. That's it, don't be too angry. That's not a good trait generally in society. And then of course, we need to be able to adapt and learn at speed, increasingly extreme speed as the world around us changes. So adaptation is seeing what is changing, seeing what is going on around us, understanding the implications of that, and then having being able to put together a plan to adapt. And then learning at speed, our brains are plastic. You know, how many of you were actually taught how to learn either by your parents or at school? The vast majority of people that I talk to were never taught explicitly how to learn. Isn't that ironic when we say that learning is actually one of our core human skills? Then again, as organizations, as we see the automation of skills, as we start seeing the dissolution of T-shaped individuals, as we see the end of skill silos, I encourage every organization to really, really think about how they maximize horizontal career mobility. Now, what I mean by that is how easy can you make it for your individuals, your staff 
to move from one business unit or one career track to something completely different. So that's important because as this career, as this job, this skill becomes automated, you can either make them redundant, in which case you lose all of that human capital that you built up within your business, and the person being made redundant definitely doesn't like being made redundant, even if they hate the job, or you can take them with you. Now, for example, a good example here is Accenture. Accenture made 17,000 jobs redundant a little while ago, but didn't make a single person redundant because they just moved them from here to here. But what I'm talking about in this slide is actually embedding that policy within the DNA of your company. So again, throughout this entire presentation, hopefully what you're getting is we have the opportunity through technology and human ingenuity to fundamentally rethink how organizations work and fundamentally, shall we say, rewire them. And then when we talk about using artificial intelligence, increasingly we want to be able to use AI as I have with my own daughter. So click this QR code, basically, and this will take you to a set of videos. We want to be able to use new technologies to help us reskill people within the organization as fast as possible and upskill people in the organization as fast as possible. And with my daughter, as well as other students that I teach uh, in my regular life, uh, we've been able to accelerate human learning 12-fold. So that is the done number. We think we could probably push it higher and faster. So if we use virtual reality, for example, we've been able to increase uh, retention, knowledge retention by 64% in students as well. And these students are generally aged 10 to sort of 24, kind of university age. So we have new technologies that let us reskill, upskill, and retrain faster than ever before. And then that is the end of that. Now, if you liked this presentation, do feel free to subscribe and comment and everything else. However, my bio link is here. If you scan that QR code, you get access to all the codexes, which you can get down there. However, you also get access basically to all my YouTube channels, social media accounts, and of course, me on LinkedIn. So that's the real me. But thank you for listening. Thank you for making it to the end. And have a great day. And I hope you feel better prepared now. Ta-da.